Good morning and welcome to the First Baptist Church in America. We extend a particular welcome of those to those of you joining us for the first time or those returning after an absence. It is always good as well to see familiar faces. The presence of each of you broadens this time of worship. If you are a first time visitor, please sign one of our pew pads. Responsive invitation. One, gracious God, you are to be praised for the women and men whose faithful witness to your love and inspires each generation of your people. Abraham and Sarah. Who believed your promise even when they were old. Isa of Jerusalem. Who in a time marked by terror proclaimed that the lion would lie down with the lamb. Ruth whose loyalty to Naomi became a model for people of every time and place. Esther, who risked her life before the king to save her people. Paul of Tarsus, who was beaten and shipwrecked while carrying the gospel to us, the Gentiles. Mary Magdalene, who ran from the tomb bearing witness that Jesus was alive. Who spoke afresh of salvation by grace, alone through faith. Roger Williams. Who advocated for religious liberty and soul freedom for all. All the saints of this congregation, past, present, and yet to come, let us pray. God of all people, we recall the names of these witnesses. We pray that they will inspire us with their extravagance excessive love, flagrant mercy, radical affection, exorbitant charity, immoderate faith, and intemperate hope, as in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remain standing if you would and join in singing the hymn that is printed on an insert in your bulletin for all the saints. scripture reading today comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. This comes at the close of Joshua's life as he is giving final instructions to the people. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve the Lord in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This day we remember the saints, all the people of God, living and dead, 
who together form the body of Christ. We remember and we give thanks for their lives. We remember and find strength in their faith and in the faith of all the saints, both known to us and those known only to God. We grieve so many. We feel such loss even as we cling to hope. We encourage one another by remembering their names. We have witnessed lives well lived and lives cut too short. We dwell within this great cloud of witnesses where we continue the struggle for justice and love in this world. Still, we lament their losses. May their memories be a blessing and a light to our labor. All right, so we have some, uh, some, some, some extra special guests up here. Welcome to Miss Colleen and Mr. Larry and to Amber. Now, some of you may wonder, why in the world do we have a dog in church? Can you help me out here? Why do we have a dog in church? Oh, it's a service dog in training. Well, not yet, but it's a service dog in training. So can you help us understand what is a service dog and what is a service dog in training and why, why in church? So she is a service dog in training and she is learning how to be appropriate in all public places, including churches, because the person that might be paired with her might go to church, might go to Target, might go to the grocery store. So we take her to all the places that we would normally go, including church. So what, what are things that would be helpful for a person with a service dog in training, for people like us who aren't used to dealing with service dogs in training? What would, what would you help train us? That's what I'm saying. And I'm sure our kids have ideas. What would a person who uses a service dog want someone to know? And what would be helpful for all of us? I mean, I see our kids are loving up your dog right now. Well, you think as a person who is paired with a service dog, they would want the public to know that that dog, of course, is working the whole time and, and really is a tool that's performing a task for that person so that if you really, really, really couldn't help yourself and you were hoping to pet the dog, you, sh you should absolutely ask the person if you can interact with the dog and absolutely don't be offended whatsoever if they simply say no because the dog really needs to completely focus on the person they're paired with at all times and not look to strangers for love or affection because then they'll lose focus on the person they're paired with and not be able to kind of perform some of those duties for them. So even if it's, what if it's a really cute dog? <laughs> it's a really cute dog. In October of 1635, Roger Williams was banished from Massachusetts for harboring new and dangerous opinions. He fled to Narragansett country where he received refuge. And here he continued to develop these ideas into what we now recognize and enjoy as religious liberty and the separation of church and state. And friends, maintaining these ideals requires participation and vigilance. Coming up on Two years now after the January 6th, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol building and on, in many ways, democracy itself, our nation has been taking stock. Congress and law enforcement continue investigations. Those responsible are being identified and held accountable. But we as a country are asking ourselves important questions. What have we learned? Where do we go from here? What does this say about us? And how do we prevent history from repeating itself? Those of us who are regular attenders here at First Baptist in America have been going through the Book of Judges for some weeks. And um, it, it is not light reading. And I think what we have seen overall from the Book of Judges is there is this repetitive pattern there's this cycle that the people fall into where 
The people go their own way and they lose sight of God and they begin to suffer and be oppressed and then they wake up and realize it doesn't have to be this way and they call out to God for saving and God sends a liberator. And for a time, it works until the cycle begins to repeat. For now, we're putting a pause on the book of Judges. If you read all the way to the end of the book, it is one of the most horrific accounts of domestic abuse. It is Domestic Abuse Awareness Month here in October. This is beyond the scope of our service in this morning, but I will name that reality that many live with. We are mindful that this is still true and that this can happen in any family. So how do we prevent these cycles from repeating themselves? Whether in the book of Judges, in our patterns, in our nation. And we as Christians in particular are engaging in necessary self-reflection as we continue to grapple with what happened in D.C., particularly because so many of the insurrectionists claim to be doing God's will. They did this in the name of God as they attempted to overturn the election results and interfere with the certification of votes. The motivations and contributing factors that converged on that day are multifaceted. But Christian nationalism was immediately recognizable as a factor as in the attack as it played out live. Attackers used the ideology that, that conflates political allegiance with allegiance to God in an unholy alliance, in an attempt to bolster and to justify their actions. This was an attack done in Jesus' name. All you have to do is look at the posters and the signs that people held up. Things that said, Jesus saves. Some folks even carried a Christian flag into the chamber. And these images are textbook examples of Christian nationalism, an ideology that, that distorts the Christian faith and message. By, by doing this, in the name of, of Jesus, the rioters ended up using Christianity essentially as a kind of mascot, trying to lend credibility and social acceptability to their behavior. Because for folks with this mindset, the Bible and the church aren't necessarily symbols of faith. They're weapons in a culture war. And that day served as a wake-up call to many of us about the dangers of Christian nationalism. Because as we know, ours is not a Christian nation. That was on the books from the founding. Yet the United States is beset by an ideology that seeks to conflate American and Christian identities. And for those of you for whom this term is a new one, Christian nationalism is a cultural framework that merges civic identity and a narrow interpretation of Christianity in a way that distorts both the Christian faith and our democracy to the detriment of both. Love of country is a beautiful thing. It, it leads people to, to all manner of noble service in, in, in public schools, in the military, as volunteers, as advocates for policies we hold dear. But Christian nationalism is an extreme form of patriotism that demands a position of superiority while leaving very little room for dissent. It threatens all our religious communities. And it is the antithesis of what Roger Williams staked his life upon. The founders of our nation made the radical decision to create a religiously diverse democracy where all faiths and no faiths can be welcomed. And by contrast, Christian nationalism implies that one must be a very specific and narrowly defined version of a Christian in order to be a good or authentic US citizen. And friends, that's not true. It's this conflating of church and state is a form of idolatry that can lead to the oppression of marginalized and minority groups. And it often provides cover or even legitimization for racial subjugation and white supremacy. The Christian flag was not the only one they carried through the state house, the, the, the Capitol building that day. The Confederate flag was there too. 
and they did this in the name of God. Friends, this is blasphemy. Our faith calls us to see the image of God in all people and to love our neighbors as we love our own selves. And as people in the church that Roger Williams founded, we utterly reject this damning, dam damaging ideology. We are bound to Christ by our faith, not by our citizenship, not by our race, not by our adherence to a particular creed. Here, we are citizens in the realm of God. Our nation, our state, this church was founded on the principle of religious liberty. And Baptists were early dissenters against the, early, the colonial Protestant establishment, contending that faith cannot be coerced. Roger Williams went to profound lengths to ensure this liberty for all people, including those whom he disagreed with utterly theologically. He notoriously declared that what forced worship stinks in God's nostrils. All people ought to be free to make their own choices regarding their beliefs. And in spite of what you might have heard otherwise, ours is not a Christian nation. Thanks be to God, this is a good thing. It's a good thing. It is, our God wants people who make a willful choice to follow God. In his final rousing message to the Israelites before his death, Joshua proclaims that one should choose who or how one serves. And Joshua encourages his brothers and sisters to follow God, but he doesn't force them to do so. He declares his own intention. He says, as for me and my own house, we will serve the Lord. And then he leaves room for others to make their own determinations. Choose you this day whom you will serve. If it's the God of your ancestors or that of the land in which you now dwell. Thousands of years later, Roger Williams labored to make such a choice possible. Choose you this day. Friends, we still have that labor, still have that task, still have that choice. Not all Christians believe the same way, and that is okay. It is all right. That's why we have plenty of churches singing different kind of hymns. Government sponsorship diminishes our faith. It doesn't uh, bolster it. I mean, why did Roger Williams leave organized religion? Because he felt that once it had been married to the state, that it lost its legitimacy on earth. In addition to being harmful for minority faiths, government-sponsored religion isn't really even good for the religion that it endorses because the state tends to only magnify the elements of religion that it agrees with while suppressing the voices and perspectives of the faith that criticize the state. And once you have aligned yourself to the power in the state, it's a lot harder for the religion to criticize that government. Some of the greatest abuses throughout history have come from places where church and state, religion and state were not separate. And in fact, some contend that because we have this wall of separation here in the United States, this leads to far more people going to worship and believing in God and holding religious values. The rabbi David Safferston has said that one of the greatnesses of America was precisely in separating church and state, and that protection of religion has allowed religion to flourish in this country with a diversity and strength unmatched anywhere in the democratic world today. We don't have any second-class faith in this country. We can live together in religious pluralism and civic harmony without sacrificing our respective beliefs. We don't have to agree with a neighbor theologically in order to serve alongside them or to lend them aid. Frankly, we're better for our differences. This lively experiment of, of religious liberty, however, must be sustained with intention and effort. It doesn't just perpetuate itself, friends. And in particular, we as Christians have a burden here. We have extra work to do when the name of our God and our faith is being used in ways that are counter to our own beliefs. The way that we tell our history matters, particularly the stories we tell about our beginnings as a nation and its ties to religious liberty. 
So it is up to us to reject distortions of our founding narrative, of our faith, to call this out, particularly when it inspires acts of violence and vandalism, intimidation and hate crimes. So often, those who embrace this distorted view of Christianity, this Christian nationalism, tend to use the language of religious freedom in describing their efforts to prioritize Christianity and give it special protections. We need a renewed commitment to protecting religious liberty for all of us, not just for a privileged few. And rules that prohibit government sponsorship of religion are safeguards for religious freedom, not acts of religious discrimination. And if we don't do the work as people of faith to call this out when we see it, if we don't distance ourselves from this misuse of our faith for political reasons, we risk tarnishing our, our faith's reputation and distorting the gospel beyond recognition. We cannot take religious liberty for granted. It is a freedom that people around the world do not have. We cannot take faith freedom for granted, particularly in the time when many civil liberties are being threatened. This is something that we have to fight for in each generation. This is our work to do. Again, Christianity and Christian nationalism are very different things, operating in fundamentally different ways. While Christianity is a religious tradition, Christian nationalism is a cultural framework that co-ops and it melds aspects of Christianity into layers of assumptions around what it means to be American and what Americans look like and think and act in the world and how government should operate. But Baptists were some of the first dissenters against the colonial Protestant establishment. The chief argument being that faith cannot be coerced and all are free to make decisions about their faith. Our country is experiencing the loss and decline of Protestant privilege. And some Christians are confusing the loss of privilege with the loss of religious liberty. You hear me? This is a big distinction. The loss of privilege that you've been accustomed to because you've been in a majority is not the same thing as the loss of liberty. Dr. Walter Brueggemann has warned that when our claims for gospel truth are attached to political and economic power, they are inevitably distorted and designed to maintain the privilege of the status quo. And the chief danger of this kind of ideology is that it makes God a captive and it domesticates God. And it leads us into a politics of despair in which we believe nothing good can happen, nothing can change, that we are fundamentally stuck on some track and there's nothing we can do about it. We might as well just stay home. However, Dr. Brueggemann goes further saying that what the freedom of the gospel that God does permit us to imagine is that there is hope and possibility that we will fashion new policies and new relationships that are beyond any one particular vested interest. So this is gonna take some work on our part. Dr. Diana Eck is engaged in what she calls the Religious Pluralism Project at Harvard Divinity School, and she distinguishes between pluralism and diversity, where diversity is a fact. It's demographics, where people who are different live in close proximity. But pluralism is intentional. It's a positive engagement that includes respect for other ideas, identities, and it has a relational element to it. It has, further than that, a commitment to the common good. Pluralism as a civic concept with a theological dimension of, of perhaps interfaith cooperation suggests that we don't have to agree with our neighbor on thing like, things like creation or even salvation to serve alongside them and to give others aid. So while for centuries political philosophers believed that for democracy to succeed, societies had to be religiously homogenous, but the founders of this nation built something that no one else could have imagined a proactive, religiously diverse democracy. And this was on purpose. It was intentional. So while there are those who would double down and insist that ours has always been founded as a Christian nation, 
We would do well to remember our founders wanted to create an accepting form of democracy with religious liberty. We aren't so much a melting pot, friends, as we are a potluck, where everybody shows up and brings their own dish, having a big welcoming table, each taking care of the needs of one another. Ibu Patel has said that America is America because we welcome the contributions of people from a range of backgrounds in large and small ways. The anti-Muslim bias that we see today is very similar to the anti-Catholic bias that we saw a century ago. There's a, a Muslim child cancer specialist who was about to perform a surgery on a child of a parent who the doctor overheard on the phone saying that Muslims should just leave America. And so the doctor overhears this and turns to the parent and says, do you want me to leave before or after I perform your child's surgery? How then, friends, do we live? We have core values that sustain us, truth-telling, refraining from demonizing those with whom we have honest disagreements, moving through the world with a posture of humility and love and mercy, protecting our neighbor's faith freedom as we would our own. Jamar Tisby has offered a helpful acronym for how we might move forward, because friends, we are a people of hope. So first we can have ARC, awareness, relationships, and commitment. Educate yourself. Be aware of people who aren't just like you, not just the sound bites, not just what you think you heard someone say, their cousin, sister's neighbor's brother, about those kind of people. Get to know them yourself. Do some firsthand research. Educate yourself. None of the second, third, fourth hand thing. So awareness, relationships, actually get to know people. Real human beings, talk to them. Don't just say, well, I know what those people are all about, so I don't even need to have a conversation. Really? Educate yourself, be aware, have real relationships, and then make a commitment to do real things that make a difference. Some of this is just coming together. We have an opportunity at the end of November. Congregations on the east side, Jewish, Christian, um, the, the Vedanta Center, we come together for an interfaith Thanksgiving service to gather foods and, and make sure that people in our neighborhood don't go hungry. So we can do this in a small way. That's very minor. The clergy from the East Side get together about once a month because we want to know each other. We want to know each other. We want to come in each other's spaces. And we want to know each other before there's a candlelight vigil and something terrible has happened. We want to know each other because we're delightful. I mean, you know, they're lovely. And you are too. So what I encourage you to do is to step out of your comfort zone a little bit. Make relationships that are real. Make a commitment to step beyond this, to speak out when you hear a distortion. Events like January 6th remind us of the urgency and importance of our shared mission. We need to stand up and speak up. Be aware, educate yourself, pay attention. Discover what you appreciate and admire about others, religious communities, whether you agree with them or not. Build relationships. Stand against the use of faith to crush others. We do this work as Christians because of our faith. And as we remember and celebrate the life and legacy of Roger Williams, bear in mind that his new and dangerous opinions did not come without a struggle. All these years later, we must continue to put in the effort to uphold and sustain religious liberty for all. Choose you this day whom you will serve. We will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.